prefix called dialogue, widening your horizons. Hi, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Grace. And together we have three guests here, uh, all our youth. Of course, we are going to talk about the post-budget 2015 discussion of from the youth perspective. On the phone with me, I have Abdul Wahab. Uh, Hi. Hi, Hello. <laughs> and you are a Hello. law student from the ASEAN Law Student Association Malaysia and you're also a student of the National University of Malaysia or in Malaysia it will be, uh, in Malay we call University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and on in the studio, the we have two guests. Uh, Ivan Paul S. Gruwal, he is a political secretary of YB Datu Masukong. Welcome. Welcome, uh, thank you. <laughs> And of course, uh, we have a student, Megat Hanis, from New City, uh, Islam uh, Islamic New City of Malaysia. Yeah, hi, good morning. <laughs> good morning. morning. So, to talk about the post-budget uh, discussion, of course, the, it touches on many areas, uh, from women, education, youth, uh, economy, uh, e- and even on GST and stuff. But right now, we are going to focus more on areas that really directly impact youth, uh, Malaysian youth in specific. So, first of all, before we start our conversation, I I just want to know what was the impression of the budget to you when you saw it on on the news, uh, on TV, when Prime Minister Najib Razak presented? Maybe uh, we can start with Megat first. Okay. Uh, First of all, um, the moment when I, I... when I heard uh, the budget because I, I did not actually literally see it just heard it um, and, and then when I read about the budget um, it was uh, good on paper it was good on presentation uh, because uh, a lot of uh, as usual for example uh, any budget uh, presented for education a uh, higher if you can see the PPPM 2030 and 2025 uh, the budget that uh, presented for or provided for education is much more higher than the OECD uh, level. Isn't it a good thing? It is a good thing, but the thing is, uh, when we question about the budget, it's not about how much the government spent for our education, for example, because it is a lot of money. For example, uh, our, our recent budget, how government uh, distribute the budget for for the youth, it's all good uh, in paper. The amount is good. But the thing is the, the, the management of the fund. So what we want to know is the blueprint of all these uh, One Malaysia Youth uh, City, the plan pembangunan or the, uh, the plan uh, transformasi beli negara or we call it national program of uh, youth. Youth transformation youth program. Transformation program. Um, but the thing with the budget is we don't have a blueprint like what we have on employability we have a national uh, graduate employability uh, blueprint so we can check the progress that have been done throughout the years uh, when but, we want, but it yeah. seems like it, it is just launched for this particular budget yes so yes. maybe they haven't produced yet. yes yes so, th- so exactly <laughs> that's why uh, when i want when i want to comment about the budget you can see the amount is good just that we want to know how it is. Uh, so managed. it's not meeting your expectation as in like yeah, how, you yeah, want, yeah. How, how you can benefit yes, from yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Because you want to mm-hmm. see the blueprint. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you? What was your impression? And you are working uh, with one of the ministers in the cabinet. So what were your impression? To me, <coughs> to me, the budget strikes the right balance. It strikes the right balance between what is needed to grow the economy, what is needed to empower the youths, what is needed to empower education in this country, while at the same time being respons- fiscally responsible. So I think what's most important is that we must look at the budget in a holistic way. I think a lot of people look at the budget as a magic wand. It isn't, it isn't that. Mm-hmm. The budget is about managing the country as a whole. It's about providing for development, but it's also about how you run the government pay but salary staff, pay my salary. But how, how much of it do you think it is addressing the problems of today's youth are facing? Well, I think no one budget can solve all the problems that the youths face in this country. The budget is not a panacea. But what's most important is that, as you rightly pointed out, the Youth Empowerment Plan, 
the sorry the youth transformation plan the special housing incentives for first time home buyers the assistance on uh, as, uh, assistance for them to pay the loan um, the monthly repayments on loans that they take for their houses the specific uh, initiatives to grow the higher education sector in this country these are all important for youths and also schemes for youth employability so all of these aspects have been addressed in the budget now um just a little response on the blueprint i think the budget in itself is a blueprint the budget is not a speech yeah the budget is a very thick document so we should not just so maybe understand the process better that the budget speech given by the prime minister is actually a summary of yes. what of uh, of what the 2015 budget is all about but actually the p budget in itself the budget proper i would call it is a large document and then the monitoring of how government money is spent is evidenced in the auditor general's report so next year you can actually look at the auditor general report and then you can track it from there so the system is actually very much in place mm -hmm. yeah. and what about you abu uh, Abdul Wahab, uh, d do you feel that the budget itself really gels well with your needs as a youth? Um, my opinion, I totally agree with Paul uh, because we have to look the budget in a very holistic way. So, uh, regarding your question that uh, it just meet my expectations, so it's uh, actually it's not surprised that they are giving a lot of money for the youth capital program because we can see from the previous years they have high end for you and every single thing about their youth program. So um, it doesn't meet my expectations, but I think that there are too much money spent for the youth development program, but there's no effect. Mm -hmm. but, so uh, your, your problem is not so much on the... the not so much on the budget allocation, but more on the implementation, I would suppose? Yeah, yeah. That's I see. Um, okay, so m you, just just to put uh, the discussion on cost, let's talk about the problems that today's youth, or at least uh, what you are facing right now as a youth of Malaysia in terms of uh, the challenges of li um, of employment, the challenges of education, and l just you know living and breathing in Malaysia uh -huh. in general. If you can summarize in three key areas that you think uh, are the key problems that young people today are facing, uh, perhaps you can share, Megat. Uh, for me, uh, I've listed. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of problems uh, facing uh, students in Malaysia, uh, particularly the youth. Um, but one, three of the main factors or three of the main keys that contributing or uh, as a barrier or a challenge for the youth, uh, first of all is, uh, of course, uh, the economy, the cost of living, the higher cost of living. Second, uh, of course, employability. And third, uh, third uh, the unity, the, 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 the unity among different races. The um, And, of course, uh, I would coin it in a way, I would say fundamentalism in each of the uh, racial groups or any ideologies or be religious belief. That's the main problem uh, facing a youth today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what about you, Ivan? I think the I'm I'm a youth as well. Actually, I'm only 29. So yeah, no, same age. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, yeah. same I'm 29 age. as well. Yeah, because sometimes people think that you know political secretary is very old. Uh, but, uh, but you I'm don't look of, old. Uh, <laughs> In a, in a positive <laughs> way. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> but I think uh, I agree with my friend in the studio. Employability, mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest issue at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the second uh, thing is obviously cost of living. Uh, I'm a Malaysian. I live uh, in, in, uh, in an urban area. And uh, yes, I think cost of living is an issue. But um, the third uh, aspect, I think that's also very, very uh, important to me, I think is the youth and um, the youth opportunities especially in rural areas because uh, i work primarily in Telo Intan, where my boss is the mp and also now minister in the prime minister's department i think one section of the youth that has been forgotten um in by all the youth groups and by many of these uh, 
groups that came to represent youths in this country is actually rural youths. And uh, I'm heartened that at least the Youth and Sports Ministry is now looking seriously into unemployment of uh, youths in rural areas, providing them economic opportunities, providing them social entrepreneurship training. I think this is another whole section of society that somehow or other we urbanites here seem to forget because we are obsessed about the larger, more philosophical issues, I guess. And then we are forgetting that actually there are large number of people who simply do not subscribe to our philosophical debate simply because they need to look at their own stomachs first, their own um, future first yeah. as well. Well, um, just to um, add uh, one question to yeah. that, uh, previous years Malaysia uh, unemployment rate was around 10.2 percent. I mean, compared to our neighboring countries, it's considered pretty higher than the other countries like Singapore, Japan, South Korea, and so on. So, um, does the government actually look at the examples from the other countries to actually implement the systems in Malaysia when it comes to un un unemployment issues? Actually, our unemployment rate is only around 3 percent. Uh, now, the I mean, including all those rural areas as well. We we, we take it collectively. Mm -hmm. It's about 2.9 percent now. That's the latest statistic by the Labour Department. Okay. So we have one of the lowest uh, unemployment rates in in the region. In the region. Yeah, but <coughs> sorry, but um, the unemployment rate is 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 an important factor. But I think it's not only just. The unemployment rate is a quality of jobs. We need well-paying jobs, high-paying jobs. And these are areas that the government's looking into now. So it's not about just creating jobs, but we're creating value jobs. I think that's important. Yeah. So as we, we strive to be an a economy that's uh, high income by 2020, which is only five years away now. That's correct. Yeah. I think the focus should be on, on well-paying jobs. And, and I think uh, that's why the economic transformation plan uh, that was implemented by way back in 2010, 2011, looks into that specifically. Mm -hmm. We will talk more about employment later on, but mm -hmm. just to go back to the question about youth challenges in Malaysia, Abdul Wahab, do you have yeah. anything to share? Yeah, I do have. I, somehow, uh, I will get um, over to you guys. They are talking about a very general view the employability, but um, I'm going to talk about on how the youth actually they lack of understanding about themselves. Well, um, from my point of view, because I'm already 21 now, so I'm already youth. So um, I think <laughs> most of the youth have uh, has this kind of behavior where they don't know what they want to be, what their future is going to be like, and even they don't know what they are having now. And most of them, they are actually over control by their parents, um, what they want to do, what they are having at the university. And to be honest, I was in the same situation when I was 18, that my parents asked me to do law. So right now, I am actually doing something that I don't want to do in my life. But it gets better in time. I mean, like, when you are 18, you want to do, you don't want to do law, that somehow I'm, I'm a dog, 21, so I think it's good that I'm taking law um, is at my course at my university. So these challenges that they the lack of understanding about themselves is actually the challenge that they have to face before they go for the employment or they go to another step of their life. And the other thing that, that, that I really think is really important is the external factor, which is like the social media currently like um they they over the, the, the youth, they um, they are giving a really bad and negative perspective to the youth. Like they are using they are using the social media to, to express themselves. So I think it's really not good for the youth because um, the youth itself they have to develop themselves to become a good youth. So when we talk about the employability, they have to look into themselves. Are they good enough to get employed to become yeah? Mm -hmm. So one thing that I notice when it comes to employment, there's this uh, huge gap between um, what the market needs, uh, the kind of skill sets and what kind of skill set the graduates, the fresh grads can offer. And one of these uh, debates is like, 
uh, whether they should be paid accordingly uh, to either the, to the scale of what a fresh grad should get or to the scale that if you have extra skills that you can bring in, then we will pay you more. And that was uh, among one of the areas that was uh, actually a hot debate. For example, uh, the, uh, the salary scale of 2,500 ringgit for a fresh grad uh, one, uh, some expert says that oh, it's it's good enough for any fresh grad to start with. Actually, we start with much lower uh, salary. That's what they said. But do you think, um, do you think youth uh, fresh grads today really need better oh, yeah. skills training uh, or better um, education uh, involvement rather than complaining that today's salary is too little for them? Yeah. The, the problem with the youth is actually they, they keep complaining about um, about the salary, but they don't know that they themselves doesn't have a lot of skills and requirements that they need to get employed. Like example, I'm a law student, but most of the law firms they don't want um, you just get um, four flats for 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 four flats for the CPA for your examination, but you don't know how to speak to the court, you don't know how to communicate very well. So it is better that um, the, the law firm um, hire a person who can speak English very well and somehow their pointer is just C and pass below. That's it. Because the requirement that the need that the world is currently made is actually the person to have a very good personal skill of that's it. Because I, I think that that's really true that the salary should be you, you must get maybe the extra allowance for you to have a personal skill set. Maybe um, in your salary, uh, in the future, you will have my like personal skill, 500 allowance. Yeah, maybe. It is. I'm not going to book, but I don't know. <laughs> well, Mugat, you, you mentioned that cost of living was one of the key mm -hmm. challenges in today's youth. I mean, how can you uh, be better at your job if you are f worrying too much about, you know, how to live day to day, you know, what kind of food you should eat in order for you to live <coughs> cheaply? So what is the balance that the government should have, you know, in terms of addressing the cost of living, especially for youth, and also ensuring that youth has the adequate skills to move up the career ladder? Okay, uh, I think uh, as much as I worry about the cost of living, you see, um, this, uh, the, the attitude of the youth uh, is one of the main problems also. Uh, because um, you can always, um, no matter how hard, the, the, you know, how hard the challenges or how, hard, or, or, or how high the cost of living, you can always make financial adjustment uh, the, way, uh, the way you're living. Because um, the way I am living, the way I see uh, the, the culture in, in the university, um, even though there's a high price, or price high or in in uh, in oil price uh, on and on goes on and 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 all the price go up. We can always adjust, but the culture of spending. This is one of the thing that I've read and researching about. Um, the culture of spending of uh, Malaysian youth is, is staggering. You see, they're, they're spending on gadgets, they're spending on on transportation, they're spending on uh, food. Uh, is is more than in, uh, more than what they can. Uh, you see, more than enough for them. So they go to Starbucks every day. Yeah, the thing, the thing is, <laughs> when you want to, um, uh, every time you want to do assignment, you go to McDonald's, you go to Starbucks, yeah. you go. So. Culturally or, or socially, if you go into reality, uh, the, the way the student live, you, you cannot, you don't see that kind of hardship because uh, they're spending too much on everything else that doesn't matter in the first semester or in the early semester and the end of the semester they eat Maggie. But then you are talking uh, from the oldest um, students or youth from um, capital KL in, in general. Mm -hmm. But how about the uh, youth yeah. from the rural areas? I mean, yeah, this is the thing. How about the, their attitude? Yeah, this, this is interesting. You see, uh, when mm -hmm. I, I, I do a research for PTPTN, you see, 70% of those who receive PTPTN are from rural areas and they are Malays. From rural areas, they receive uh, scholarship, not scholarship. Uh, or you say um, they receive fund or loans. Loans, loans. yeah. I forgot the term. <laughs> they receive loan from PTPTN, and 
the the amount of money that they receive or the amount of money that they can adjust to the cost of living mm-hmm. is more than enough it's more than enough it's just that the, the culture is 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 uh, mono, uh, the culture is homogenous in in such a way you you live the same living as others those who are rich those who are poor they buy the same gadgets you see some of a lot of my friends so uh, they have this idea of keeping up with the jonas yes this idea of keeping up with the others uh, <laughs> okay uh, my friend buy an iphone i need to keep my status up so i need to buy an iphone even though uh, is uh, he does not need it because the economic choices are not always rational that's the mm-hmm. problem so um as much as we worry about the the, the price high or the oil price or everything that goes up mm-hmm. uh the attitude that we need to adjust you see uh every week students go to watch movie ev- and, and every new movies they must have watched it <laughs> see um it's hard to see this this kind of thing uh like you said uh what about those who are poor who live in rural area mm-hmm. the government give them a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity through loans and a scheme uh, and zakat and, and we will talk about brim in a yeah, bit okay. <laughs> uh before we continue up uh, grace you you come from a you you come from south korea that's correct and you're also a youth maybe a bit of uh change of perspective from the co- south korean youth point of view how would south korean students be treated uh, in terms of how the government help them incentive education and all that well we also have problem when it comes to unemployment because our country is small but then the, um, the number of students are, is increasing and then we have lots of graduates from really good universities as well and they are the one who also face a lot of problems when it comes to jobs so the government has um, uh, uh, I mean uh, okay the, the other part that I need to bring out is the the fees education fees in Korea is pretty high so that's when students find uh, really hard to get into the university because that was uh, mainly because of the financial problem so but the good part of um, this uh, when it comes to this issue in South Korea is the government they do listen <coughs> to the students uh, when they uh, voice out the problems even though the process of uh, amending is a bit slow but then they are still trying to listen to the students so when it comes to un- unemployment issues the government creates more jobs yeah so but do then, you, like I but said, do you think the, like, go- the, the South Korean government really listen or consult they have yeah. to listen I see they have to listen because of the power of people in Korea yeah. it's a bit scary do you, do you think Malaysian problems. government listens to the youth when I it comes to their needs I think uh, Malaysian students are passive because uh, their demand is not is not constructive it's not policy based mm-hmm. you see the demand is always um, reactionary that's why that's why i so I, you you to you you think that malaysian students are reactionary to the stand that yes. they they don't know they don't even know what they want they don't yep. even know what they want they don't even know what policy exists for them you want to say something about it um yeah i guess um i think most of the problems um when it comes to youth, especially because of when I live in university where I come from a government university, I do not have any problem with education fee because it's quite cheap if I want to compare with the other um, public university and even cheaper than, it's the most cheapest if you want to compare with a private university. But the thing is with the youth in our university is they keep, um, they keep like um, you know um, they keep relating themselves with the political party and everything. They keep using themselves to join the political party association instead of they they study in university and focusing on what they want in their life. So that's the thing to do. I think maybe it's um, it's out of um, our topic today, but I think yeah that's the reason why relation <coughs> government doesn't follow what the youth want because they. They are actually joining us there, the political party and everything. But I think we don't have any problem with like South Korea, like the ADP, we have China. That's it. That's what I want to add. Mm-hmm. 
I want to throw this question to you because <laughs> one of the... I expected it. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, partisan politics aside, uh, of course, uh, young people, I mean, I believe strongly in young people being political, but not to the extent of dividing society, but to the extent of focusing on issues. So one of the areas that the government is trying to focus is to provide jobs opportunities and <coughs> entrepreneurial skills and all and providing facilities as, as well they are throwing 100 million ringgit to 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 create this one malaysia youth city project what is your view in this how much of this would actually benefit the youth well um uh, I, actually i'm throwing this to ivan paul to answer uh, okay. yeah. no, if you want to answer go ahead but okay now man, let me take this um well just uh, before we go that go on that on the issue of cost of living, I think uh, quite a lot was said. And I think uh, I agree with uh, Saudara Magat here that it is about management of finances. You know, if you have a $1,000 a month, you, you, you manage that 1000 And I think uh, employability is an issue. Uh, I was an employer previous to this position, and I interviewed a, a number of young people for positions in the organization that I was running. And what I realized is that discipline is sorely lacking. You know, I think uh, whenever you ask them to go the extra mile, mm -hmm. I think it's not Miss Malaysia, it's everywhere. Yeah, I think people are becoming more and more pampered. Mm. And the ability to go the extra mile is an issue not only in this country, but in a lot of other countries. Because I've spoken to colleagues who employ, for example, even in the UK, where I studied, and they are saying that, yes, somehow or other, you know, you ask them to go the extra mile. Uh -huh. they, they don't seem to be willing to do that. And I think that is where employers get a bit upset. So you're yeah. also talking about attitudes. <coughs> yeah, I think it's it's an attitude issue. I'm not going to call it a problem, mm -hmm. so I call it an issue. And also, I think uh, more importantly, that furthering one's studies is important. If you want to get paid more, you upgrade yourself, you subject yourself to uh, whether you want to do a postgraduate program or whether you want to do a postgraduate diploma. If you already have a degree or if you already only have a diploma, then you go out and get a degree. We have many open universities in this country, three as of now, and one is actually run by my part. Uh, one is supported actively by my party, mm -hmm. which is the Wawasan Open University. So the opportunities are out there, but we're not seizing them. So a lot of the youths actually, friend, who are friends of mine as well, they come, oh, you know, Ivan, salary is so low. But I said, look, have you actually gone out to upgrade your skill set? Yep. Have you actually made the effort? So, so you don't further. blame companies and employers no. for paying less? I, I'm, I, I think, obviously, in Malaysia, the private sector should, I mean, to, to go off track a little, m big Malaysian conglomerates make record profits every year, but they're not sharing those profits with their workers, right? Now, how can the government get involved? The government has only the ability to foster, to create a conducive environment for economic growth so that jobs come in, opportunities abound. The government does not create jobs per se. If the government were to create jobs, it's only expanding jobs in the public sector. And already the public sector is fairly large. So what the government can do is to incentivize the uh, private sector to create jobs, which is what they're doing. I, I want to touch on when you mentioned that uh, uh, conglomerates companies, some of them don't really share their wealth, so they don't increase the salary and all that. And there are some young people that would say that why should I work at the extra hours, put my extra effort when I'm going, I, I got <coughs> peanut salary. Yeah, so it has to be twofold. I think one is that the conglomerates, the big business in this country has to be responsible. Do not point, simply point fingers at the government every time and say, oh, you know, uh, the government's not creating jobs, the government's not helping us with our salary. The government's ability is fairly limited. So, so how can the government ensure that so, the private sector okay. increases so what I'm salary? So what I'm coming to that is, now, that involves massive intervention in business. I, I'm, I take approach of minimum government, maximum governance, meaning I think businesses are best to run their own business. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think there is a corporate social aspect. There is a responsibility to the country that these programmers must sit down and they must say, look, I want to be serious about this. I think that you cannot look to the government for every solution. Every Malaysian has a responsibility and they must, and all these conglomerates are Malaysians. Yeah. So it is in their interest to help other Malaysians. So they must come up and say, okay, look, whether I'm not going to name any company, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying that these big companies must say, okay, look, if you 
talk to their workers if you want extra <clears throat> if you want higher pay then you subject yourself to skills training or you go take a masters or you go uh, increase your productivity and they should incentivize this mm -hmm. so it has to be a collective approach between the worker between the employer and the government can whether come in and maybe look at incentives tax breaks or other ways to help out we can definitely i'm sure the government is open to that so what you are saying now uh, the current budget uh, has very little focus in terms of trying to encourage companies to be more no, I, I open in this approach i don't think it's 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 a it, it comes to the budget i think it is something companies must look to themselves as malaysians as responsible malaysians as citizens of this country the managers the decision makers the solution must not be from the government the solution must be something the private sector must want to do as a component of csr as a component of workers welfare this is things that they must look at and i think now we have the national wage consultative council these issues are being deliberated at the high level but the fact is that <clears throat> the government shouldn't be the one to come and tell you hey you know go pay your workers more go go share sir. i i mean if i'm an employer when i was the first thing i did when i came in was to increase the salary of all my staff though it made it made it difficult for me because i felt that was my responsibility so i'm not just saying i'm not uh, i i believe i talk i walk the talk on that issue at least but you know if you look at it the wealth gap in this country is something that i am concerned about i think it's a concern of every malaysian yeah. because the more centralized the wealth is is also not good for the economy meaning that the money will not be circulated yeah. as easily so, so we are not a socialist communist country where the government can intervene in the economy we are fairly market based we are governed by free market rules to a certain extent intervention comes in the form of subsidies and other things like that so those who actually are working in jlcs for example enjoy pretty decent salaries but those in purely privately held conglomerates don't enjoy very good salaries and a majority of malaysians actually out of 13 million work, working malaysians 12 million work in the private sector right only 1 million work in the public sector so the ability of government to influence at least in the public sector actually the starting pay is a lot better in government a great 41 graduate who comes in gets actually more but why why the government shouldn't in, intervene with the private sector if they can intervene with the public sector what's the difference anyway the the difference is one of economic philosophy i mean you know how it won't, we, we it won't are, change the market in fact it will, they will make the market better it will increase people with more money to consume you see this is where it's always been a loaded issue talking about economic philosophy and i think if the government were to intervene in such a direct way then the same very people who said oh you know increase wages now will turn around and say oh look the government's intervening so directly in the economy and we've never done that so in fact just look at singapore they had the same problem in the 80s this issue of uh, the middle income problem so what what did um, they do the singaporean companies themselves endeavored to raise wages because they took that as a csr component so i think is all these companies must come out and they must be honest they must be fair to their workers so i think please do not look to the government for all solutions because what we are what the government's able to do is is limited right but more importantly i think it's the average malaysian employer must come back today i mean if they're listening to this show go back and ask yourself how do you want your own children to be paid mm -hmm. oh, do you agree with that my god I think um, do you think should mini government should intervene minimally as possible when it comes to the private sector because I think wages is one of the critical issue besides uh, getting a job it's not that government don't want to do it it's that is uh, like uh, uh, he said it is because the government can do it because um, for my I can see it is very ideological uh, it is uh, that the, the large conglomerate the large corporation they are influencing they are lobbying the government that's all we know we know around the world they're lobbying the government that's why when uh, i am I'm, I'm, i'm a little bit skeptical about um the government role uh, limited government roles in in in, in business because we are not free so market so yeah yeah to totally the opposite of i yeah because okay. because I, i don't agree that we are having a, tot a, a true free market 
uh, through free market economy because uh, there's a lot of government incentive to the large conglomerates. They are being uh, a lot of them are ta- uh, uh, exempted from tax. A lot of them escape tax even. Um, and that's why we're having the GST, so yeah, we don't escape tax. Anymore. Yeah, that's, that's why the thing is, uh, the thing is, um, the government rules in, in intervening the market is very important. Uh, we are not saying when the government intervene the market uh, is a communist state or socialist state. It's not. It's the, 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 no, the no. I think I think I think you yeah. just to clarify that matter. I'm. I'm looking at it from a very practical aspect. What can the government? Can we pass a law tomorrow that says all salaries go up by fifty percent? Well, and then all right, we throw you in jail. I mean, these are, and then you know, obviously the people say, oh, government, you know, BN government's bad. They're putting people in jail. So I mean, well, let's, like, let's look at it in a very yeah, practical. Perhaps aspect. intervention can be in the form of the committee that you mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah. So the intervention is happening. It's committee. not there's no intervention, yeah. right? But I'm looking at it. I'm not. I'm saying don't. I, I'm ideologically, I, you know, I think let's not go into that okay, okay. because we we are a very practical. Government, we look at what's best on the what whether it's subsidies is very much socialist. Encouraging mm. business is very much on the right side of economics as well. So you're saying why don't we look at the center? Yeah, so we, we, we look at the center. I think I think we <laughs> synthesize <laughs> both the yeah. both both um both views and we take what's best. Yeah. yeah. And that is why we are I think the BN government it's in power now. It's a mm. people first government. But more importantly, I think we have the mechanism to the national wage consultative council that handles your minimum wage. We have brought in a minimum wage, right? Other countries do not have... You know, even Germany doesn't have a minimum wage. Malaysia has a minimum wage, right? Now, the minimum wage is obviously not ideal, but it will be reviewed, even, uh, you know, periodically. But more important, the mechanisms are in place. Mm-hmm. The private sector is coming. But I'm just commenting here on the private sector that, you know, enjoys criticizing the government, but they never want to accept criticism on themselves. So you are also criticizing the private sector. It's I not am. Like, it's I'm not saying like that they should mm-hmm. look into the welfare of their workers and they should at least share profits, but peg that to productivity. Mm-hmm. I'm not asking them to give a fat bonus. What I'm saying is incentivize people to work harder, incentivize people to further their education, incentivize people to do better at work. And redistribute their profits to those... No, I don't like the word oh, redistribution. Oh, I don't. like the word sharing. <laughs> that's that's too socialist to you. Okay, sharing, yeah. if that's yeah. the word for it. Uh, Abdullah, well, I want to ask you uh, about the cost of living because I, uh, BRIM is also part of the... Um, part of the uh, government's focus either is on housing or giving uh, cash handouts. Do you think uh, it works in terms of evaluating uh, the cost of living for majority of Malaysians? Mm, I must say yes and I must say no. It's actually both because sometimes we have to look at it in a very uh, positive and negative. I think in terms of the cost of living, you have to be very genius because in in, in every city, in every every city in the world, you see like Singapore or London, you must know that the cost of living if you live in an urban area in the capital city, the cost of living is higher than if you live in the outskirts of the town. So I think when I say that you have to be genius, you have to maybe you you can work in Kuala Lumpur, but maybe you can stay at Terambun and use the public transport, and that would help a lot. So in terms of the brim, how can I relate it? Well, um, the brim is actually is the money they give us, and since that um, the brim is um, they, they increase from 600 to 900, am I right? Mm-hmm. So, um, the green, they will give to the people gradually. It's not like um, you give 900 at one shot. They give it gradually 300, 300, and 300. And I think that's a, one of the good ideas. Um, so, you, in, in essence, you agree with the brim to evaluate the cost of living and all that? I do agree. Yeah. Everyone needs money. Yeah. <laughs> everyone wants but, money. But... Yeah. But um, I mean, I, I want to I want to divert this question to Megat because uh, there are there are conversation among people who disagree with Brim saying that you know rather than giving a cash handout, why don't you really address the concern of the society? Because how long you actually want to give the Brim? And you mentioned subsidy is socialist, but what about Brim? You know, it's also a form no, of, of subsidy as well. That's why I said that the, the government as well. is is, a ve- is very practical. 
yeah, we take what is best for the people, regardless of ideology. You know, that is why I said that we are not constrained. We're not like the Republicans and Democrats in, in America, or whether the Tories or the Labour in, in, in the UK. We have one government that's infinitely practical. But infinitely Brim, practical. So, so Brim will not be something of a long-term ad issue. No, it will just be... Okay, you see, let's look at Brim. Now it's 950, mm -hmm. right? Yes. The maximum. If you make four th uh, between 3 to 4, then it's about 600. It's yeah. pegged in three different payments. Brim works. I am on the ground. I go to whether it's urban areas. But how or long areas. is this an affirmative no. action or is this a no. long term no, structural I think, policy? I think Brim, the way I look at it, is a measure to alleviate cost of living. Now, when you look at prices in the nineties, the government spent between two to three billion on subsidies. That's all. Right? Whether we're subsidizing full we've subsidized two Fs. Food and fuel. And corporate. Right? I mean, that, that are other form of incentives for business, right? Yeah. But let's look at two things. We all, then you can also say we are subsidizing education, we are subsidizing health care because we spend $50 billion a year on education. We spend $24 billion a year on health care. So if you put the two biggest social service, our budget's about $270 billion. We're already spending $70 billion of that. So mathematically, that works out to about almost uh, one quarter, mm. actually, a quarter on education and health. So the government's priorities is in the right place because these are important components mm -hmm. and we are an aging society as well. What do you think? I think, uh, first of all, uh, I think the government side know that BRIM, uh, there's the two sides of it. First of all, they know that, that, that it is not a structural, like, like uh, Lin said, it's not a structural policy that can last longer or it's a long-term plan. It's not a long-term plan because it is uh, a short-term plan meant to, you know, after election or before election, it is it is a popular... A popular a populist move. Uh, yeah, populist move. It is a populist move because uh, as long... Because if you look at the rural area, their, their culture of politics, their, their, their education <laughs> about politics... When you talk about tax price or you see when the for example when I when I look at how the opposition explain policy they explain it in, in a in a, in a complicated way the the, the price of uh, cars and all that but they don't understand but if you say we give you nine hundred and fifty ringgit and we give this uh, uh, we give you uh, rice you we give you uh, sugar and all they can see it in very short term but but the second part of it is. <laughs> With BRIM, we have all the data. We have a clear data of how much poverty that we have suffered. So if how much? How much? How many Malaysians are actually earning less than three thousand? I don't remember <laughs> the, 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 um, the No, but back to mm -hmm. back to BRIM. I mean, I must defend it because it's a good policy. The reason being is because instead, one is that we have our subsidy burden. Now back to my question just now. We spend this year. How much are we spending on subsidies? Forty billion. And out of 270 billion, almost equivalent to our development budget, the subsidy bill is simply no longer sustainable. In the 90s, you didn't have China growing, you didn't have India growing, you didn't have the BRICS, you didn't have this emerging middle class in these countries. So that is why now, if they have come in, their consumption patterns have changed, their appetite has changed. That there is a pressure on the supply chain globally. So the only, but at the same time, we have to look at, and the government, being the responsible government that, that it is, has to look at also the cost of living, the burden here. So BRIM is a direct measure to address those making less than 4,000, because we cannot have a one-size-fits-all subsidy. It has to be targeted. So BRIM is the second layer. The first layer is direct subsidies that benefit all. So that will be subject to great rationalization later this year and early next year, whether it's fuel, uh, fuel whether it's food. The, so BRIM is the measure that will now ensure that those who need subsidies get subsidies. If you are driving, just say, an S-Class or a BMW, and you know you're pumping 95 fuel that's subsidized, I think that that's a bit wrong. You know, if you can afford, and you know what's the funny thing, the statistic that came out the other day? is that 95% of Malaysians still use RON95. Wow. Yeah, only 5% are using RON97. So that's why um, the subsidy on even 95 has to be rationalized.
and now the fo- the government is focusing more on targeted subsidy. Yes, and I think it's economically responsible. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, I guess but if you look at sorry, you have, you have uh, something. Yeah, but I think it's not sustainable. The government is has too much burden to focus their money to give a direct uh, direct measure or direct uh, measure or direct action. Uh, towards the targeted sub- subsidies group, I think, I think, I think the government side they know that it is not sustainable. You need a you need a structural policy in which the people who are affected by that policy they can they can save they can self um, develop. You see, you need a, a system where you don't need a government assistant. Uh, infinitely, like you said, uh, infinitely. No, no yeah. that's I'm saying infinitely practical. Yeah. Now, well, um, I, I wish you can explain it, <laughs> but we don't. We are actually but, short but, of time. Yeah, but just one point on yeah. that mm-hmm. uh, before before we wrap up. Now you spend 40 billion a year on. I think numbers always take, strike a chord. Mm. Now you spend 40 billion a year. So you know how much you spend on brim a year? It's about only three billion, right? But it actually alleviates the burden. So uh, you, by you spend 21 billion a year for fuel subsidy. Fuel alone. Mm-hmm. What about food and other forms of subsidy? So collectively, the bill is about 40 b, right? So this year has gone down a bit because we have rationalised mm-hmm. it. So in that sense, right, Brim is the right policy because it's cost-effective and it's targeted, and it's only a fraction of your of your f- global subsidy bill. How, how, how much do you see it in, in the long term? How much can... No, you see, BRIM will continue as long as it's needed and as long as people need assistance. You know, and this thing, you know, you can be rich today, you can be poor tomorrow. If you are rich today, in a sense, you've got a big house and it burns down, you're poor. So poverty so you can s- never be eradicated. So you see this as part of the structure uh, I, I, to give I, assistance for those I who think, are unfortunate. Yeah, you must. I mean, um, every country does it. America mm-hmm. does food stamps. They have sc- school tuition benefits. So even if a country as rich as America is doing it, then why are we frowning on, 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 on BRIM? You know, I think we should be supporting it. Perhaps uh, some people are envisioning a different kind of soci- uh, economic structure, which is a bit more socialist, I, pre- uh, I presume. Uh, any last message, uh, Abdul Wahab? Oh, last minute. Yeah, just very I short and sweet. Oh, well, Wahab got caught up in a very philosophical <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> um... I mean, like this is a very intellectual conversation. I think we 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 have to think about the future of Malaysia. We're not saying now. So my last message. Oh, it's, it's last. Uh, my last message. Um, let's create a better future for Malaysia. Let um, let self develop ourselves to become a better citizen. And yeah. Okay. Malaysia. <laughs> With that, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Abdul Wahab and thanks to Megat Hanis and also Ivan Paul for sharing your views. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.